tired of hitting poor shots and shooting high scores? Wouldn't it be nice to make solid, consistent contact more often? Hit more fairways off the tee and more greens with your approach shots. Lower your three putts per round and shoot lower scores consistently. Lessons with Bernard Sheridan at Impact Zone Golf at Tiburon Golf Club in Naples is the fastest way to lower your scores and start making the game fun again. Call 239-236-5536 and schedule your lesson today. Remember, if you improve your impact, you improve your game. It's that simple. Welcome to Breaking Par with Bernard Sheridan, the golf podcast that interviews the best and brightest minds in the golf industry. Now, here's your host, Bernard Sheridan. Jason, welcome to Breaking Par. Thanks so much for taking the time today. Hey, my pleasure. Great to be here. Thanks for having me on. So I see a lot in social media, um, in, the, in the groups, the social media groups. Um, mm -hmm. I know you're a very well-respected instructor in the industry. And um, so, so give us a little bit of information about how that journey began. Um, when did you first get a golf club in your hands? And when did you decide that um, it might be a good idea for you to help others in this game? Wow, that's, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a long story, but I'll try to make it relatively quick. I uh, grew up in a small town in West Virginia, uh, St. Albans, West Virginia, just outside of Charleston. Most people don't know where St. Albans is, but I grew up playing all the sports. I was a big baseball player, uh, football, basketball. And really, you know, at that time, junior golf wasn't real big in my area. So I just basically stumbled upon golf. And one of my friends, probably the only kid that played on my baseball team, invited me out to just watch. I would just rode around the cart and thought, wow, this is kind of interesting and something that I, that I might want to try. And my parents didn't play. I mean, it was just kind of a kind of a weird deal that I actually got into golf. But just started hitting wiffle balls around the yard and, and sort of fell in love with it. Got good, like, real fast because I was a decent athlete. Uh, so I started playing in junior high and in high school and started, you know, playing junior tournaments and, you know, got sort of, you know, ready to go to college. Played at, played at a small college in West Virginia, Glenville State. It was NAIA division. Uh, school, which was which was great, got to play all the time. And uh, during the summers, I was always working at golf courses. So I've sort of always been in the golf business uh, my whole life. I started just like everybody else did, picking the range and working in the golf shop, and you know just admiring the the pros that uh, were helping me helping me out along the way. So I always sort of knew I wanted to be, you know, in some capacity. Uh, in the business. So it sort of went the same, you know, the general route of being a head professional, uh, moved to Charlotte in 97, uh, just to get into a, a bigger section and have an opportunity to be a head pro, uh, which was great. Head pro at, at a club in, in Charlotte at 28, you know, not, not even close to being ready. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, it was a great experience, made a lot of mistakes, but it, it was, uh, it was, I think, one of the most important things that I did because it, it helped me figure out what I didn't want to do in the business uh, because I, I knew I loved to teach and I was very, always very curious about uh, people and how they learn and, and how, how things are taught. So uh, after a couple of years, you know, as a head professional, I, I was very fortunate to get on and, and have a chance to, to work with Dana Raider Golf School. Sure. Miss Raider took a chance on me in, in 2000 and, you know, a redneck from West Virginia that was passionately curious. And uh, that's where I really started teaching full time. I've been teaching golf, but I, I always say that I've been, I've been teaching for 25 years, but probably only helping people for about 17. <laughs> you know, those first few years, you just don't really you know, know what you're doing. I'm sort of trying to figure it all out. And so that that opened up my whole uh, world being that all I had to do was worry about getting better as an instructor and, and learning the craft. So it just allowed me to teach a, a million golf lessons. I was with Dana for 11 years and was very, very fortunate to have some success and got the opportunity to, to do my own thing and, and be the director of instruction at Carmel Country Club, which is where I'm at now, uh, which is just a, a, the next step for me, uh, which has been fa fantastic. So I've been there almost six years and I uh, just love it. So, you know, that's sort of how I got to got to where I'm at now. 
Do you think that you're not not to get off not to change the sub, but I, I since we're on a personal subject, mm -hmm. do you think your son will follow in your footsteps? I mean, I know that I I see you working with him. I see yeah. that he's doing some pretty good things with his game. Um, does he have that same passion and desire that you do, or does he is he is he going to do it more as just like hey, you know what, I'm just going to be an amateur player, but I'm going to pursue like I'm going to be a an accountant or a doctor or or a, right. Or a, an engineer, or, or whatever it is. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. It's funny you ask that because uh, you know I host a, a big workshop, a teaching workshop every year, and last year I was sort of highlighting some of the kids that I work with. I work with a lot of really good, you know, junior league kids, and he's he happened to be one of them. And you know, it's an interesting thing working you know with your son being the dad and the coach. So at the end of my talk, I, I brought him up on stage and did a little interview with him, and I didn't have a clue what he was going to say, but he actually said, "I would if he doesn't play professionally, uh, that he wanted to, to be a to be a teacher." And I was like, kind of blown away by that because I had no idea that he. I know he wants to play pro. Every you know, all kids have that aspiration, and he was, he's miles better than I ever was when he when when I was 15, um, and has a real good opportunity to play in college and. And I think he will. But, I mean, yeah, that was – I think, you know, he, he's probably watched me give more golf lessons than probably any other teacher in, in the business because he just kind of hangs out and, you know, learns. And he's really uh, – I would say his golf IQ is very, very high. So it would be interesting to see uh, if it doesn't, you know, pan out for him professionally that it sounds like he might might give it a shot. Well, a lot of times the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. And, sure. Uh, and and you must be really proud of him and wanting to follow in yep. your footsteps. I mean, it's I know that that's um, you know that's a wonderful thing for father and son relationship, and it worked out pretty good for Jim Furyk. <laughs> yeah, it did. Yeah, that's and that's the thing. I, I think uh, yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens. But we it has uh, the whole dad coach relationship is never easy, but it really has brought us closer together and. Um, you know, we've we've learned a lot about how that relationship works and and things that don't work. So it, it's been really good. I mean, he's my best my best friend, and I'm super proud of him because he's just he's such a great young man, not just a good player. Yeah, you're very fortunate. Um, you're very fortunate. It's uh, there's not a lot of dads who have that kind of relationship with their sons. I have a relationship like that with my son too. It's not in golf. Um, I was actually in the audio business before I got into golf. And he's following in my footsteps in that way, um, mm -hmm. moving into film and, and uh, music. And, That's great. Um, and I did that for many years. I did that for 30 years. Um, I've been teaching for, I'm going into my 19th year now. Okay. Um, so, but, it, but I know how that feels. It's, it, you know, we're fortunate to, to have that happen to us. And a lot of people don't. A lot of people don't have That's that right. happen. For sure. So, so you work a lot with junior players. I do. Yeah, it's just part of what I do. But I, I do. I'm fortunate to have some good kids that uh, have gone on to play college golf. And then, you know, we've got a huge membership at Carmel. So it's such a great environment. You know, we got so many kids and we got a big, I think, probably one of the biggest junior programs in the country. And so we just keep breeding these these great kids. And, and I'm just fortunate to, to be a part of their lives. So as, as a parent out there or as a junior who is interested in um in getting involved in a good junior program uh and since you run a very good junior program what are some of the things that you would give as advice for them to look for talking about the parents yeah like the well and and the kids yeah. too but i mean yeah. like you know there's the the parents um and i know that some parents get a little bit uh o go a little bit overboard i had sure. some of those i don't deal with the parents as much now that i'm with impact zone because it's not my academy so it's not really um where they put me um with juniors i'm more with adult players when mm -hmm. i had my own academy up in pennsylvania which was par breakers golf academy i was with everybody and i was dealing with a lot of juniors but yeah. but i know that there's a lot of adult that there's a lot of parents who would come to me and say you know what should i be like what should i be looking for in an instructor what should I be looking for in a program? What are things that that I uh, should try to seek out to make sure that my child is getting the best in junior instruction? And, and so what are some of those things, pointers that you would throw out there to them? 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's important that they go and talk to the to the instructor because I think you can get a good feel for does that does that instructor really like to work with kids? Because it's not for everybody, you know, just as well as I do. It's yeah. not some some people. It's just not their thing, and that's fine. So you've got to kind of have that feeling that this this guy or this girl is really really going to care for my child. You know, they're really going to be involved in in their in their follow up. You know, it's not just about coming to the clinic and letting them go. It's like, okay, can I communicate with that person? You know, especially when you start moving through the ranks and then getting up into tournament golf, uh, we know how important it is for for the parents and the coach to communicate. But just I think from a, a ground roots standpoint. Uh, you need to see structure. You mean, I think you need to see a plan. I mean, we, we use iGro, which is kind of a new uh, program out there that is just fantastic. We were actually the first. It's called Op 36 now, Operation 36. Yes, yeah. As a matter of fact, we just uh, yeah. interviewed them. They were on about three weeks ago, Operation fantastic. 36. Yeah, Matt, Matt and Ryan are both just I mean geniuses, and they've done such a great job. We were the first club to actually adopt uh, that program. So I saw it from when it wasn't even finished yet at the, at the PGA show a couple of years ago. And I was like, sign me up. I mean, cause it had so much great structure. I mean, I know these guys have pulled from different avenues, whether it's TPI or, you know, some of the things that those guys, so it involves not just golf, but it involves life skills, fitness, you know, it's got everything and it has a progression. And I think that's really, really important. So you know, it's just important. I just tell parents to, to just do your homework, right? I mean, you know, if you talk to enough people who's doing who's doing good things out, who has the reputation of, you know, putting out. And it's not all, all obvious about, uh, you know, building junior tournament players. It's just about getting kids to fall in love with the game. Right. I mean, these are our future members. That's, what, that's how we look at it. So we just want them to have fun. But also we want them to build their skills. It's not just... You know, it's not just babysitting for us. We actually want to see them improve, and ultimately that's what's going to keep them in the game is they're seeing some improvement and getting better. Now, here's a good question because you said babysitting, and I see that happen. I've seen that happen a lot. Um, so when you have uh, uh, juniors that that are in your program and it's more like a babysitting service, um, and and you know what I mean by that, but, yeah, but, sure. but as an explanation of that, it's like they're, they're kind of – they're kind of interested in golf, but they're more interested in goofing off with the other kids that are there. Right. Um, so, so how do you, how does your program handle that type of thing? And, um, and without chasing away, uh, the client. Yeah. Well, it's, it's good, but I think there is a part of that. It has to be in your program because it's sort of, we have different levels, right? So we have our, I grow up 36, which would be, semi-serious kids and you know the parents kind of know this is what we're going to do we're invested in a 12-week so semester or we're invested in two or three or four years for my child but then there's the other ones that say okay yeah my kid's not really sure but let's just give him a chance to get to get his feet wet so we also have games classes and we have uh, we call cam uh, we have combo camps where during the summer they'll come out and golf will just be a portion of it those are more of we what we consider the babysitting style you know but again we're trying to get them to have fun but we just want to get them out to the golf course and introduce it to them and that's okay i mean that's that there's a part sure. that needs to happen in that and then those kids hopefully you know spark and and get ignition and keep asking their parents hey we want to go to the golf course and then they start to grow and then we put them into the the more serious you know camps and in the agro system right so then that way now they're more focused on golf so then so then the kids who are in that i grow i grow system are kids who are really truly interested in the game not there because their parents say look you're going to golf camp because you need to learn golf because when you get older it's going to help you in business it's going to help you in relationships um it's a good way to forge uh uh networking with other with other adults and you need to do this and the kid says well you know i want to play baseball or i want to play soccer um and then they're sending them there anyway so, so they're not in that kind of program. Right. Yeah, it's, it's definitely, I mean, and the kids are playing baseball too, but I think it's great to have some, some other activities they can fit it in. Kids are so busy nowadays. Oh, I totally they're, agree. Like, lacrosse is really huge in Charlotte. I mean, they're just, soccer obviously is huge all over the world. So it, it's okay. I mean, they just have to sort of find their way. And I think it, it helps build a lot of agility and, 
hand-eye coordination if they play these other sports. So I don't have a problem with it. We do, we do the aggro. We do, we basically do spring and fall, and then summer we do camps. Okay. So they have the opportunity to kind of you know transition in and out of those uh, different classes. Yeah, I think it's usually important that they play a lot of different sports because you're right. It it um it helps the eye, the hand and eye coordination. It helps balance. It helps them translate into golf what they do in other sports and and how to um get more out of their golf game via the athletic endeavors that they were doing someplace else for sure so when it comes to um to really technology and things of that nature what type of technology are you using and and what are you using it for yeah i'm using right now i'm using trackman uh, exclusively, I use uh, Body Track for for pressure mapping. I've just become a brand ambassador for Body Track, and I really think the new product is outstanding. Uh, and I use Sam Putt Lab because I do teach a lot of putting. I'm sort of a little bit of a putting niche guy, uh, and you know, sort of getting that reputation a little bit in the last few years. So uh, those are the three main ones I use. And and really, what I do is I, I do just the measure. I mean, it's a, you know, it has no. I always tell everybody that you know, TrackMan has no philosophy on swing technique. You know, all it's doing is measuring what the club's doing, measuring what the ball's doing. Same as Sandpot Lab, and so it's up to me as the coach to sort of administer whatever changes I want to make with the student. But for me, it just measures feel. You know, it just measures the the feel of change and whatever we're doing with that player. Uh, and it, I use it just about every lesson. I mean, you know, and, and I, I know a lot of times people say, well, that's really over technical. But I, I think that I am do a really good job of blending sort of old school methods with new school technology in a way that it doesn't feel like a technical golf lesson if it doesn't have to be. So, I mean, I'm pretty versatile. So I think that's that's so important. But I, I'm big on technology. I think it's, you know, I think it's so valuable to give the student feedback uh, and the learning curve just is so much quicker that way for me. I totally agree, um, especially when it comes to uh, pressure mapping. Uh, I know that we use Swing Catalyst. Mm, that's and, right. And I find that it, it really helps, um, uh, like when we see players uh, changing their swing plane or changing their path mm-hmm. a lot. Um, or if they have a drastic out to in or, or drastic in to out for that matter. And then we look at the pressure mapping. We can start to use that pressure mapping to change that as opposed to them trying to change, like as, as opposed to a real old school where they're saying, no, oh, you need to come more from the inside. You need to drop right. the club drop. You need to do this. And, and it's hard for players to feel that. But when they feel things with what their feet are doing and where they're creating pressure, um, mm-hmm. those things kind of fall into place. Have you found that too? Yeah, I mean, it, it, I think every player is different. I mean, I, that's why I, I call it, I throw a lot of things against the wall and see what sticks during a golf lesson. I mean, I try to hit all the senses. I mean, I'm, I'm big on trying to figure out what their learning style is, but a lot of times I'm just trying to figure out what works best for that player. And some some players respond, if I can cha- I change the club and then the body changes, and then some players do the opposite. I'll change, you know, I'll use the ground and, the club so i think it just it depends on the player not everybody you know does the same thing or, or learns or feel i call it having the the awareness of of change it's like some people have body awarenesses and, and then some people have hands arm and club awarenesses that i think can really get changing really quick and I, i'm big on manipulation so i i don't just stand back there behind the track man go just swing more to the right or swing more to the left i right. get in there i'm moving people around and that's something I'm really good at is it's not easy. I get I, I train all my staff and, and and people that come watch me teach that ask, you know, how does that how do you do that? It looks really easy, but until you get in there and start figuring out where to put your feet and where to put your hands and how to move the club, you know, it can be very, very difficult. So it takes practice and I think it's a it's kind of a lost art in my opinion that I can get results very, very quickly uh, without having to say a whole lot and letting the student feel it and then also getting feedback from them rather than me just telling them what they need to do right now i i found too that um with with the pressure mapping uh it's that feel factor happens so much quicker um, yes because they can they can kind of 
feel they can do what they're doing and then you can actually like show it to them live while they're right. doing it um and that's what i think really makes a difference because now they can feel and see where they are and then it starts to register better um in their head whereas opposed to if you can't see it you only you may be thinking you're feeling something but you're feeling something completely different yeah, for sure. I mean, I think it, it's so helpful to have quantifiable analytics right there in front of them and say, you know, they're trying, they're shifting their weight too much. I mean, you know, the, the difference between COM and COP is, has been massively helpful, I think, to my players because, you know, the old school is like, hey, you got to shift and load your weight and people are doing it way too much. Ultimately, they can't get back to the front side and into impact conditions that are going to help them hit the ball solid. And so what feels like very limited shift, say you shift 75 or 80 to the right or whatever, what your your parameters that you look for, and they're going, wow, I feel like I'm this, and then it's actually this. So it's just, it, again, it measures the feel, the change, and I've been able to get really quick results. I mean, the, the body track's great. Swing catalyst is awesome. Um, definitely, uh, I think it's part of the arsenal that has to be there. Oh, I totally agree. So, so you mentioned COP and COM. So... Mm-hmm. I know what that is. A lot of people out in our audience don't. Um, yeah. Explain to us what, what the difference between those two terms are. Yeah, so center of mass is basically always always equated to just standing in, you know, where's your center of your body weight, right? And I, this is just simple logistics as far as how I explain it to a student. So when you start to move, that's pressure shift, right? So when you see that ball move on body track, you see the swing catalyst, you know, start to move, that's the pressure so we're trying to get, you know, not so much as much mass moving. We just want the pressure to move. And that's just what we're applying to the ground, uh, basically, and not so much shifting or loading your weight. So it's how it really shows up in, in how they feel the ground with their feet. So I found some interesting sort of things as we go forward. We have the foot joy, uh, the, the uh, shoe fitting deal as well. As well. So it's kind of neat to see how different shoes affect people's uh, pressure shifts and I've seen some shoes that are really causing some issues and stability and I'll have people take their shoes off and actually hit on body track in their bare feet, bare feet so they can really start feeling the ground so yeah we're just trying to get trying to get the pressure to move instead of so much the weight to move and I think that really opens people's eyes and, and how it feels with you know pushing off the ground rather than just shifting their weight back and forth yeah, a gentleman who uh, was actually from your home state, I believe, um, used to do that very often uh, back in the 1940s and yeah. 50s. Mr. Sneed. Uh, uh, yes. Yes. And he would go play without any shoes on. Yeah. And, um, and I always encourage my students just to, for fun, just to try that um, because it, it's amazing what you can feel uh, without your shoes on and mm. uh, because now it, you know there's nothing between you and the ground and um, and as you said there's certain shoes that aren't going to allow you uh, to make the proper uh, positioning and the proper movement through the golf swing for sure yeah it's really interesting you can learn a lot by just watching people's feet and how they move and then how the stability in the in their footwear is either helping or it's hurting them yeah, I think that in in the technology realm, that's the latest thing now. Um, that's the that's the newest thing that most of us are using, and mm-hmm. um, I think it's really accelerating the learning curve. We're seeing people learn a lot faster than ever before due to that fact. Absolutely, for Think sure. About it. So yeah. so so, what are some of the things that you're working on most of the time with your students? Um, and what is the thing that most of your students are having issues with when they come to you? Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, I've got sort of a framework and it's nothing, it's nothing earth shattering. I mean, you know, when I'm looking at a golf swing, I, I think they're you know, very similar to uh, sort of what Jim Hardy has talked about over the years where there's pluses and minuses, right? So I, uh, I look at, you know, draw pieces and then fade pieces and then how we can put those together to to really get people to hit the desired ball flight or a functional ball flight. So I'd say m- most of the time uh, I'm trying to get the golf club to swing more to the right for most folks that, that slice it or come over, you know, come from the outside. And I'm trying to get them to control low point. I mean, that's my 
that's my number one, what I call my mastermind skills is just controlling the low area of the swing, whether it's, you know, hitting the ground in the right place with an iron or being more level or whatever you want the student to do with a driver. So it's about sort of, you know, orienting their body, uh, the pivot arms and hands to sort of match, you know, what that, what that looks like. And if you got too many fade pieces, which most are, you know, 90% of my day is, you know, working with, with average club golfers and members that swing out the end, then I'm trying to get, you know, decent setups and I'm trying to get, you know, relatively decent grip. So I'm looking at club face and path a lot. Um, I think one of the most difficult things to, to speaking of sort of body pivots is to fix, you know, fix the humpers out there, the, the early extenders that, you know, really can't get to impact properly because they're in their own way. So that's something I've really, I really focus on is what are the, what's the lower body doing, um, you know, to, to establish a free arm swing where they can get the thing into impact and, and compress it decently. Um, but yeah, everybody's different. It's a moving target, right? I mean, you know, I got, you know, guys that are swinging too far to the left and I'm going to put some draw pieces in there and guys that are swinging too far to the right and we'll put some fade pieces. I mean, some of my best players, uh, probably the best player I teach right now that was on uh, the web.com is, is a fader. So we, I try to do everything to keep the ball from going left with that guy, you know, but most of the people need draws, you know, for the average player that need to hit a little farther, you know, I'm trying to get them to, you know, get the, get the pressure shifting forward, you know, keeping the body closed a little bit longer, getting the club to drop a little more to the inside, you know, all these things that are very difficult for these average players to do. And they just have a functional, functional ball flight. Now, do you use like any type of, um, uh, physical things to help them achieve that? Like maybe put a, put an alignment stick in the ground or, or, uh, you know, and tell them to swing under it or, or any of those type of things, or, or most of those things uh, that you're working with are more with their footwork and, and where their path is? Yeah, I, I mean, like I said earlier, I move them a lot, um, but I do use, I do, I do like external cues. I uh, will put a shaft in the ground, put a noodle on top of it, and have them swing under it. Um, I use noodles a lot, I, and I basically will hold noodles around them in where like if I'm standing to on the downside or the, the backside of my player, you know, say a guy's got the club going too far to the inside and he's lifting it, coming over it. Then I'll put the noodle out in front of them. So I want you to miss it on the top side and then miss it on the bottom side, you know, just give them things that are not going to allow them to cheat. So they can really feel the exaggerated sort of opposite, uh, feel, uh, I will use dow rods a lot for start direction. I'm big on the, the goalpost drill is I'll stick the club, stick a, a dowel rod out in front of them, right in line with the target. And if I'm trying to get somebody to, to hit a little push draw or a pull fade or whatever shape, and I'm going to put the other one on the other side. And that gives them that visual of, you know, is my golf ball really starting where it should? Because most people, you know, it's amazing how the, the ball flight they get used to is really not accurate of what's in reality happening. They don't realize how far to the right the ball needs to start from the golfer's view to uh, to really get the ball, you know, get a functional draw, you know. So they're, they're starting it left and drawing. Well, I'm hooking it. I'm like, well, not really. You're actually pull drawing it. So we just need to get the start direction more to the right. So it's just lots of visual stuff that, that I use. Uh, but, yeah, I'm just, again, big on manipulation and then, you know, getting them to, to do something. I, I'll push them. I'll push them around a lot in opposite directions think that's so valuable not just moving them in the right direction but i'll get them to move in an opposite direction and i'll try to resist them and really gives them they, they actually have to do it rather than me doing it for them right that's been really helpful for me i know that i like the idea of something out in front of them because it gets them to be more towards target mm -hmm. um, and it gets them uh, for some reason i've seen a lot of light bulbs go off in students heads when they have to hit it right of a of a stick or something like that Sure. And then they start to find out what their body has to do to make that happen. Um, at first, they start to push it way out to the right, but then, uh, you know, things start to start to come together, and and it's it's a good way for them to feel what's going to happen and see what's going to happen and be more focused out in front of them than mm -hmm. at down what's on the ground in front of them. Yeah, for sure. And I, I think it, you know, that's why the TrackMan's so helpful because. You know, if you got a guy that's 
maybe he's swinging in, inside out plenty, but the face is closing, ball starting to the left. I call it the fake out ball flight. And somebody said, you know, I had a guy the other day, exact same thing, and he's like, I get, he said, I'm, I'm coming over the top, which I don't even use that, that terminology, but we know what that means. And I said, no, I said, look, every single, every single swing you've made, you've had a rightward path. We just got to get the face more to the right. And he's like, oh, wow. So we made some face adjustments, got the ball started on the right. Now we got a little bit of a push draw. And I don't know that I ever would have convinced him if I didn't have that data stand, sitting there in front of me going, here it is. You know, I'm not, you know, you can believe me if you want, but this is this is the truth. And all of a sudden, the light, you know, we, the, we got to the problem super quick. We could, well, all, all instructors could probably see that, but then getting the student to actually buy into it, I think, is is often difficult. And that's what I like about TrackMan, um, it, that exact fact, yeah. is that it's those numbers are those numbers, and 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 you can actually go up there uh, if a student doesn't believe that and make an exaggerated swing and yourself, and right. then they'll see that and now and they go, you saw what I just did. Now you see it there. Now do you understand that what what you're doing here is this? And then that's the, so that really um, it's kind of like a way for them to more easily trust what you're saying as opposed to like not believe what you're saying. Um, and I've got video attached to my track man too. So I'm looking at video and numbers. So it, it kind of, again, it kind of hits, it's the analytical, visual, kinesthetic all at once. And, you know, it's, it's pretty hard not to, not to get, you know, the, the analysis that I give them right up front, pretty darn quick. And we get the solution, you start working on it and, you know, off you go. Yeah, I know. I agree. And I, I think mm -hmm. that any, any of you listeners out there who are interested in, in taking a lesson, um, you definitely want to find someone who has some of this equipment um, because it, it'll really accelerate the learning process for you. Uh, there's no doubt about it. So if there was a book out there that you would recommend to the audience that could help them improve their game in any way, what oh, book wow. would that be? And I know there's a lot of them. Yeah. Because yeah, um, yeah. there are a ton of great books out books. there. Yeah. But, but for I you, what's something. your personal favorite? Oh, gosh. Um you know, I really love Swing Secrets and Lies by Mike Hebron. I mean, that's always comes up in my, in my top five. And I think anything from Mike Hebron is excellent. Um, you know, in, in the, what I'm reading now is uh, Dr. McCabe, which is a good friend of mine, just from, from the from the uh, the mental side, uh, the mind side, is the manifesto is outstanding. I mean, I would I would read a lot of the mental stuff. I give my I give my players a lot of Rotella stuff. You know, because I think that it's it can be very confusing. A lot of the, the golf books can be fusing, confusing to the average player. We can understand what they're trying to say. Sure, of course. I think a lot of times it confuses them, so I, I, I won't give a lot of uh, players some swing technique books a lot of times until I can sort of sift through what they, how they interpret it and then tell them how that's going to apply to their game. Um, but I think, you know, anything on the mental side can definitely I thirty second golf swing is kind of an oldie from TJ Tomasi. It's one of my favorite mental books. I thought I like that book a lot. I read that yeah, book many years people, ago. It's a very, yeah. very good book. Just, you know, building a building a solid pre shot routine, I think yeah. is you know, it's just awesome stuff that I think can only help uh, help players. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I mean it's because and, and if you look at all the best players, they all do that. Every one right. of them. And it's right around that 30-second mark, too. Right. Yeah, I think it's just, you know, it can be invaluable stuff. I mean, I've got I've got hundreds. I mean, I, I was, uh, you know, the young guys out there now, it's all about podcasts and, and reading stuff on the Internet. But before, you know, before the Internet, man, that's all we had, right? We were, right. I read everything I could get a hold of. Yep. And, and I, I've got a, a pretty pretty extensive library, which is, which is cool. And I'll go back and look at the old stuff like Manuel Delatory stuff or, you know, Chuck Cook wrote a, wrote a great book, Perfectly Balanced Golf, if you can ever get a hold of that. I mean, just some of the old stuff is, is, is so helpful and classic. Um, you just take a little bit from everybody. And that's it's sort of where, where I'm at now is, you know, so many people have, have mentored me and information and sift through it and you kind of find your way and then teaching a lot of golf. And then you start to figure figure out what works and what uh, what doesn't work. Yep, Absolutely. <laughs> So, so for people who would like to work with you when they're in the area, what's the best way for them to get in touch with you? Yeah, well, I'm at a private club, so it's a little, it's a little <laughs> it's tough, a little difficult. Yeah, um, 
but if you do get a spot, you can get a member sponsor and come work with me. Um, you can just, you know, it's a Carmel Country Club in Charlotte, North Carolina. But I'm always, I'm always happy for coaches to come by and and, and watch me teach. My door is always open. Uh, I'm big on mentoring because, like I said, I'm trying to trying to just pass along the the valuable information that I've gotten from my mentors to to other young coaches and players. And uh, you know, you can email me golfgurutv at gmail.com uh, and I've got a website golfgurutv.net um, that you can go and look at I've got hundreds of articles and videos and I've got a YouTube channel so there's a lot of there's a lot of videos out there floating around that I've done over the years that that can get them head, a head start but I'm happy to answer any questions that that I can awesome great well Jason thanks so much for taking the time to be with us today really appreciate it and uh, until we meet again do your best to keep it in the short grass. Thanks so much, partner. It was great. All right, take care. Are you tired of hitting poor shots and shooting high scores? Wouldn't it be nice to make solid, consistent contact more often? Hit more fairways off the tee and more greens with your approach shots. Lower your three putts per round and shoot lower scores consistently. Lessons with Bernard Sheridan at Impact Zone Golf at Tiburon Golf Club in Naples is the fastest way to lower your scores and start making the game fun again. Call 239-236-5536 and schedule your lesson today. Remember, if you improve your impact, you improve your game. It's that simple.